Okay. So, good morning, everyone. I hope that you are all doing well in this very crazy time we're living in. Um, for this presentation, or virtual training presentation, we are going to work with the assumption that some or most of you do have some idea of fluorescence microscopy or light microscopy and a basic understanding of electron microscopy. I think Saf has had training sessions on both these uh, modalities independently. So we are going to, well, in the interest of saving time, go on, focus on all the aspects relating to bringing these two modalities together, but I'm not going to spend half off of the session and Lisa as well describing the the basics of the of each microscope entity if you do have questions regarding that please um, feel free to to leave your questions or or any questions during the session just leave it um, in the in the chat box and Lisa or I will monitor the, the conversation tab. And if there are pressing issues, we'll try to answer them in the chat, but, but we'll make note of everything and answer all the questions afterwards. Uh, we ask that you also just please keep your microphones muted unless there's some kind of emergency <laughs> or uh, and um, also keep your cameras turned off. Okay, so let's jump right into it. Uh, my name is uh, Jürgen Kriel. I started working at the SAF Electron Microscopy Unit in March, and <laughs> then the pandemic started. So I've been finding my feet here, but I do have a lot of experience regarding CREM. And uh, Lisa is the head of the fluorescence microscopy unit at Stellenbosch, and she has actually been mentoring me in this since I started with CREM. So I'm very happy to be presenting this uh, workshop uh, alongside her. Right. So what is CREM? It's basically combining the best of both worlds between uh, electron microscopy and fluorescence or light microscopy. Each has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. For electron microscopy, you can go down to nanoscale resolution. Uh, it's in terms of biological material, ultrastructural localization of different uh, organelles or uh, structures and so forth. And um, the way you see this is through staining your material with some kind of electron dense uh, element, with heavy metals or uh, electron dense particles. And you are pretty much uh, looking at a snapshot in time because these are fixed and dead material at the end of the day. So there's no dy dynamic data as such. Uh, with fluorescence microscopy, you are working at the sub-micrometer scale. There are specialized uh, systems like super resolution and bomb, storm, stead, uh, more fancy things that will get you down to nanometer resolution, but in general, the more comfortable area to work in is the submicron space. You get a lot more functional information because you can tag different proteins and parts of a cell, parts of tissue. Uh, with your fluorophores of interest, you can design plasmids, uh, do anything pretty much. What If you can link a plasmid to a fluorophore, you can see it in the cell. But your resolution is always quite a limiting factor and the localization of these fluorescent markers is only going to go up to a certain point. You can capture living or live events, and based on this data, you can fix the cells and uh, capture that snapshot to bring these two together. Now, it's not that simple. Uh, <laughs> this is just a good representation of um, a cell that was uh, taken under the fluorescence microscope, localized this under 
the electron microscope and we could see where our different markers um, lied and that are associated with vesicles. So that's why CLEM originated is because there were disadvantages for each modality, each kind of microscopy entity, and it was, it was brought together. Now when starting CLEM and going into the characteristics of it, it is very important that you have a well, well-defined research question. Uh, just for those that are joining in late, we, we've already started. So um, please feel free to ask questions in the conversation tab and we'll get to your questions uh, afterwards. Right, uh, so for CLEM, you need a very well-defined research question. Most of the time, there is a microscopy element to a certain thesis or a project that can be on and the research question can be answered plainly through electron microscopy or fluorescence microscopy. When you formulate your research question, it is likely that uh, you are going to be combining some functional information with ultrastructural localization uh, to use CLEM. And we will help you to define this. If you do think you have a need for CLEM, then we will uh, work through your research question with you. But important is that this has to be defined more or less at the start of your project or as you go through your PhD, sometimes you realize, okay, or your master's or um, whatever research project you have, that uh, you can contact us for this information. And then a, a good example of this is if you have localization of specific proteins within cells and tissues that you want to define uh, more, um, much better, uh, or another associated with association with proteins. This can be anything from looking at how uh, certain mitochondrial proteins localize ar around the organelle, or um, in the case of bacteriology and virology, especially now that we're seeing with COVID, um, we're seeing a lot of EM images in the news lately, and people are using CLEM to a certain extent to characterize how uh, the virus enters cells. Um, and localizing the proteins to their um, different parts of, of the virus. So uh, the takeaway message for, for this is that you need a well-defined research question because your research question is going to determine what kind of combination we will do. Uh, Lisa and I uh, will work very closely with, um, with you on this to determine what kind of combination you need because fluorescence microscopy is quite a wide field, electron microscopy is quite a wide field. So we need to determine, are we going to combine confocal and electron microscopy for you? This is usually um, localization of large proteins and organelles, which confocal is fine. In some instances, you need a lot more structural detail on the flu fluorescence side already. And, um, then you would need a more super resolution approach. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but uh, that is more computationally intensive then, and it would uh, impact the whole workflow of the process. Uh, we've recently acquired a serial block phase um, electron microscope, which is um, my baby at the moment. Uh, uh, it's here at Tigerberg, uh, where I'm stationed. And we are in the future going to be able to combine um, fluorescence microscopy with uh, three-dimensional electron microscopy. So then this would be a use case where you would need to resolve a structure in, in 3D, both on the fluorescence side and on the electron microscopy side. So the planning for this is of utmost importance. We can't, in the middle of the CLEM workflow, uh, go back in time and restart something. So it's a very intensive, um, or to a certain extent, quite intensive, but the data you get out of it is uh, usually uh, very novel and quite, quite good. So that brings me to why use CLEM. In the past, for especially electron microscopy, it was fine to have an image and say, okay, this is my structure of interest and people just had to believe you. These days, it's a bit more complicated. A lot of reviewers and journals now, um, in terms of relevance, 
for us for publication, they are requiring people more and more to back up their findings in electron microscopy with a certain element of fluorescence just to confirm that it is in fact the structure that they're seeing is in terms of a, a protein that's associated with it or some secondary signal to validate their findings. Uh, so CREM is becoming more and more prevalent uh, in the research um, community and almost in the next decade, I'd say it will be a standard requirement for some um, electron microscopy workflows. So it would definitely enhance the relevance of, of a certain study. Then in terms of, of novelty, this is the, the part I love most about CREM because in certain instances, whatever you find is, <laughs> is uh, to, to some extent quite novel. There are, um, I, I'm thinking of uh, part of my PhD study where for decades, uh, the certain vacuoles I was uh, looking at have just been, uh, they've been seen under electron microscope and people just have to believe that this is what they are. But when we started doing CREM, we realized that the vacuoles are not always as um, basic as they were previously thought. And uh, this turned out to be something, something quite novel. So it definitely adds, adds novelty to your research. And it, it, uh, for this aspect alone, to me, at least, it makes it quite worthwhile. Segmentation is something uh, more associated to this uh, three-dimensional space. Uh, we, with our um, new uh, three-dimensional EM system, uh, we now kind of exclusively have to make use of them to know which structure we want to resolve or, or focus on uh, in, this, in this case. I will um, elaborate on that a bit more uh, later on in the presentation. Great. So then your question would more like most definitely be where do you start with them? The first thing would be to define the amount of detail you require in your data. And with detail, I mean the, the kind of resolution you require in your uh, electron microscopy image, um, as well as to a certain extent the fluorescence. So what we offer from SAF side is um, the shuttle and find approach. Firstly, which is, it's a bit quicker. Uh, there's less processing required. But um, your trade-off is going to be there's a bit less detail on the EM, but uh, as Lisa will describe um, now, you will you are able to combine this quite heavily with other um, electron microscopy uh, modalities such as EDX and EDS and so forth. Uh, in terms of a more structured requirement, uh, requirement or more structural detail required. Okay, is uh, resin embedding. So this is uh, well, this makes high-level ultrastructural detail possible because you are embedding the sample in resin, and I'll take you through the protocol uh, later on. But yeah, the, the trade-off for this is it's quite time-intensive. So if you require, let's say, a section through a cell in this case, and quite high levels of detail to determine that this um, GFP tag protein of choice is actually localized in these vesicles, we would have to go through this approach. Here you can see the outer morphology of the cell, but it was in this case necessary to show that the entire actin network goes through the cell and that's all that they needed. So your level of detail you require will determine uh, the workflow in this instance. And uh, Lisa, I think this is where where you take us through the shuttle and find approach. And after that, I will go through the, the resin embedding approach. Okay. So, Thank you. Um, I will share my screen now. Um, if you All can right. Just... Then I'll just swap. Great. Uh, I have to find that now. Where is it now? Oh, come on. I don't see my screen on Teams yet, so if you just bear with me. It's showing here on, on my side. 
Okay, is it the um, slide with the um, shuttle and find the different steps? Um, no, that was just the, the intro slide. Yes. And, and it's, it's gone wrong, now. The wrong one. Let me just quickly see if I can find the right one. It worked in the beginning before you guys were on. Um, there, it, there, there it is. Yes. Okay. You should see the PowerPoint, which at the top left, it says shuttle, shuttle and find um, yep. a workflow. Let me just present. Right. So um, the reason why we present together, um, I was at SAF, or when we started Clem at SAF, the whole reason was that we had upgrades to, to our super resolution microscope. And we bought a new Merlin microscope, oh, Merlin e electron microscope in the um, in 2015. And both of these microscopes had this this software feature called Shuttle and Find. They're both Zeiss microscopes, so it's it's fairly easy then to um, work with both microscopes and the software, etc. So um, the the Shuttle and Find protocol is fairly easy. In, in terms of um, how the process, I will go through it in a minute. Um, and at the end, I will just briefly say why it is necessary sometimes to go for the other option, which um, Jurgen will go into detail with. So if you do the shuttle and find um, protocol, um, you would basically have to put your samples onto a cover glass. Um, we have the insert for 10 grids, but um, due to logistics, we really don't use this anymore. We um, try to optimize and for, for many reasons, it's not really worthwhile. It's more worthwhile to go with um, Jurgen's uh, protocol. However, the, the, the workflow that we use is this with the specimen holder for cover glasses. So you would have to put your sample in sample preparation onto this cover glass. You would have fixed it. You would have embedded it if necessary. Um, I wouldn't actually say embedding, um, but labeling whatever you need to do to get it fluorescent and into this um, sample holder. Then, um, as I said, you would put it into the sample holder. I'll go on about that in the next slide. And then you would put, uh, perform your either wide field. LSMs is another word for confocal microscopy. And as Jurgen said, uh, super resolution as well. We can do all three of these. The um, most useful would be super resolution because the, the resolution of a confocal microscope and the resolution of an electron microscope is quite different. Um, with a, an electron microscope, of course, you reach a much higher resolution. But if you don't need high resolution images, which you also can use an electron microscope for, confocal is perfect. Um, then once, once you are done with the confocal microscope, if there is a few things you can still do to the sample to prepare it properly for the electron microscope, you can do this. The, the most important part is that you can't move the sample off from, from the covers, cover glass. It has to be in the, on the cover glass, and preferably if you can keep it in the um, specimen holder, that would even be better. Then your correlation will be um, the most accurate. So there is a bit of a limitation in what you can do between light microscopy and electron microscopy. You can't just go and take it off and wash it and embed it into something. And um, this is why we don't use this method for the resin embedding part. But if you can use your, your, your sample as it is on a cover glass, you can just move it to the electron microscope. It is important that your sample is very dry. Our Merlin um, electron microscope is uh, very susceptible to um, wetness or actually oily substances as well. So you need to be careful not to have any oily substances. You can't, for example, we sometimes use a wax pen to surround our samples. You can't use that because this, that will leave a lot of um, contamination in the column of the Merlin. So there are things that we need to keep in mind when we do this um, correlation between on the, in the shuttle and find method. Eventually, at the end, you would do your then once you've imaged on the electron microscope, um, we have a sim. We, our Merlin is an FE sim, and I would recommend that you um, follow the other webinars or go back into the videos of the other webinars and, and to what the Merlin actually can do. And then the evaluation and analysis part is something that you can either do in the Zen software, but there are many other software um, options as well, which Jurgen will probably um, discuss at the end.
So, um, what is this shuttle, um, the sample holder? Everything about shuttle and find uh, relies on good correlation um, coordinate points. In the sample holder, you have your cover slip, which will fit into the cover slip um, space there. And then you have some sort of a lid that will just make sure that the cover slip is tightly fit into the, onto the sample holder. Then you will see there's the one, two, three little blocks here. And inside each block, there is a little L mark that it's a it, um, it's see through. It's trans, not translucent. There's, it's actually a hole. And I'll show you on the next slide what it looks like. That those three spots are used for correlation or for coordinate saving on both sides uh, in the software. The software on the confocal looks like this. This is a shuttle and find um, feature where you would select the sample holder for the cover glass. And then there's options that you on our microscope the uh, and depending on the orientation we put the slide in we will see these L marks um, with the uh, horizontal part on the left hand side sometimes you would see it the other way around and um, if you use custom made slides where you actually made your own coordinates which we've done with laser um, we, we've we've tried to put laser marks onto um, cover slips as well, and sometimes they would look different, and they would be black instead of of white. Um, yeah, we the the soft this image selects black, but it depends on what your image would look like. Then at the end, or when you do the coordinate calibration, you would go to the position one. You would focus. You make sure that, that it's in the sick in, in the middle, and if your L mark is nice and clear you would just click on find marker. Automatically, it will allow you to go to the next marker. And if you've set your automatic movement to the next position and you've ticked that box, it will go to position two automatically. You can do it manually as well. I prefer manual because um, I'm not always sure that my orientation and the microscope's orientation is correct. And then I, I don't want to bump my um, objectives into the side of the stage just because they, our orientation is different. So I go to the next position, I say find marker, it saves it, I go to position three, find marker, save it, and at the end, once all of them are there, it will say calibrated. Um, you can restart the calibration if you're not happy, but um, let's say we're happy with the calibration. This is the slide holder that we have. You can see there, number one, number two, number three, and this is what it looks like under the light microscope. We usually image the, these um, markings with either the 10 times or the 20 times objective. The 20 times objective is more accurate, um, but it, it depends on what, what you prefer. The um, length of the um, sides are about 50, 51. Um, remember, I'm measuring the line here. It's probably about 50 micron, and then in width, it is about five and a half micron thick or five micron thick. So you can see that it's not nanometer scale, but it is quite small. So your accuracy of your correlation depends a little bit on how accurate you um, save your calibration in the software. Right, when you get to the electron microscope now, you have a very similar box here. We also open Zen software on the electron microscope. And this box here on the left, although you can't see, I can explain to you. Same calibration, you have your, you choose your sample holder, you click calibrate, you say choose um, position one, choose position two, choose position three, and save that calibration. And the nice, the very, very beautiful part of this um, correlation is once you've calibrated the, the sample holder on the electron microscope, all you have to do is to open your fluorescence micro microscope um, files that has to be CZI files because they've, in the CZI files, which is the Zen um, uh, file format, the metadata saved with the file actually have the coordinates in there. And then as soon as you've opened this file, the fluorescence file, all you have to do is to choose an, uh, an area that you think you might easily um, identify and you double click onto it. It will immediately send a message to the EM stage and the stage will move to that position already. And once you've start, you start your imaging of electron microscopy, you should be very, very close to the same position. Um, and then, of course, you set up your electron microscope to take the most beautiful image that you can on the electron microscope. Um, lastly, Zen also offers the correlation to overlay these images there. Um, 
there's just you would basically identify points that you can see usually three um, that would be a good option these are fiducial markers they are beads that is added to the sample so that you can identify them fairly easily so that would be a good bead to use this bead might be a good bead to use and possibly something on the right and if you use these three spots tell it that these spots are the same one this the software can then overlay it so yes a uh, an example we've done. Um, if your fluorescence microscopy image had more than one color, they will be in different channels. You'll have we have here a blue channel and a red channel. And then after the shuttle and find overlay is done, the software creates one more channel, and that would be the electron microscope um, channel. And then there you have the choice to overlay it or take a color away, etc. I, we've done quite a bit of work on the shuttle and find um, protocol. One of the most important things that I found that we've we've in 2016, we went through a major learning curve of what how to do this. It's not just double click and there it goes and you easily find your samples. It is important to realize that the images on the fluorescence microscope give you a certain perspective of the sample, which might not actually be um, visual when you get to the electron microscope. So if you just focus on an area, if, if you look at uh, block number two here, there are very few real markings that you can identify easily. So if you get to an electron microscope um, and you just want to have a zoomed in image, it's very, very hard to find specific features that you can correlate. I've, we've, um, for an example, I'm going to go for this um, sample, but the most important, important part of this image is the fact that I want to um, emphasize that we start with wide field images. We start with a wide view of the sample so that we have an idea where where the feature is that we are going to um, focus on eventually. If we don't have this wide view, um, it's very hard and you, t you basically waste a lot of time searching. Um, then we take more in-depth photos. Um, for example, you still, I think this was taken by a 10 times objective and maybe even a tile scan. This is probably a 20 times of, um, image. I can go back in my data and check. And eventually we would end up with the image that we really are interested in. This is probably a 40 times objective. Um, so when we get to the electron microscope, why it is also difficult, you can see that this is fairly easy to identify. There's this little um, loopy, loop to loop um, feature. But what, uh, what it happens on the electron microscope and the fluorescence microscope is the way the sample is mounted might not be give you the same orientation on both microscopes, which makes searching for a feature even more difficult. If we didn't have this loopy loop thingy, we might have struggled a long time to find other features. I can see there's another little loop, but to identify without the, the major feature here, it might have taken us quite long to realize that that loop there is the same loop as this one here. So it is important to look for features and it's important to have wide views and to realize that it might take you some time to find um, the same features. Then um, on the next slide, the software, you don't have to do the, the switch around. The orientation is automatically by, by the shuttle and find software feature changed so that there's a good overlay. Sometimes they are, it's not completely accurate, but um, it's not the end of the world because the information is still on both images. Um, the, the reason why this could happen is, um, are in, uh, is a, it could be slightly angled, um, the angle on the, the fluorescence microscope and the angle uh, eventually on the electron microscope might slightly put, have some offset or um, there's drying taking place between the two modalities. When, when you watch it on the fluorescence microscope, it might not be as dry as it is on the electron microscope, which might have slight changes in position. But it's not the end of the world. The information is still very valuable because we actually know that these are the same um, fibers. What makes it very useful to do this is that on the electron microscope, now you have the option to go into much more detail. This is an, a zoomed in um, or a, a much more magnified uh, image of the same loop-de-loop -loop type of thing. And then you can even go in much deeper. This area here is the same area as here. 
And now you can see that these are not completely smooth fibers. There's a little bit of cracking. Um, whatever features could be interesting on a much more, much higher resolution can then be found on the electron microscope. So just a few exam other examples we've done. Um, we've published a few papers. This was a, again, polymer science, a polymer uh, feature. On the confocal microscope, the, some of the components of this um, matrix, or the, it's an antimicrobial um, matrix of fibers. They, they spin the fibers into this type of um, fiber mat. And then the one part of it was chitin nano whiskers. These were labeled with red fluorescent dyes and we could image them on the confocal image. Another thing that we could see, the other part of the component of the matrix was um, silver nanoparticles, and they autofluoresce in the, this blue range. So you can actually already see where these chitin nano whiskers and the silver particles lie in terms of, in, in comparison to each other. However, there are other, there's one more component of this, this um, matrix that we can't actually visualize with a, fluorescence microscope and that is carbon. So with the electron microscope you have the option to do something called element, elemental analysis. You can take an image and, and based on some elemental um, properties the electron microscope can distinguish between carbon, silver, gold, etc. Everything that you can find on the, um, the periodic table. So here we've identified carbon, Again, of course, silver is, a, is an element, so the silver can be identified. And if you overlay everything, we can actually put a whole picture together of where does the chitin and whiskers, the silver nanoparticles, and the carbon lie all together. Um, in biology, we've done a study on, um, or this is a study on clotting, blood clotting. So these big round um, circles are red blood cells. And then they've um, created this, research has created a clot with fibrin fibers forming and we've labeled labeled um, certain parts of that fibrin fibers on an on a confocal microscope you can't see the background you can really only see the fibers that did label with the protein where on the electron microscope you can properly see the background and the structures so you can confirm that all of the fibers did have the green protein but there were none in the red blood cells the um, contrast on a light microscope is very, very little. Um, so it would have, you might have seen the red blood cells, and, um, but you might not have seen other fibers. And we can confirm with the electron microscope that there aren't other fibers that didn't stain with the green. One last example. This was a study we did on persimmons and it was published in the Free Journal of South Africa. Um, and we were featured on the front page. South African persimmon is um, viewed under the microscope. Here we've done almost all the microscopy modalities that we have. The first one here is a normal bright field image um, that we took with a bright field microscope. And if you see on, in, in, if you look at the fruit, the persimmon, there are sometimes these black spots in the flesh. If you section that, we've frozen it, we sectioned it, and then we looked at the samples under the microscope. And these um, black spots are actually cells that have a darker um, darker color, but they aren't the only um, big cells. They were also non-translucent uh, uh, cells around it. When we put the same sample on the confocal microscope, we realized that both of these types of cells, the dark ones and the light ones, have a very different autofluorescent profile. You'll see there's the dark spots are actually uh, reddish in autofluorescence, but the white lighter ones are purple or in the violet range of autofluorescence. So we can actually, with autofluorescence, we can distinguish, apart from light microscopy, with confocal microscopy, we can also distinguish between these two types. However, once you get to the electron microscope in the SEM, you can see here that there are these big um, cells, but we can't distinguish which one is which. We need some sort of overlay, either the fluorescence that we, we did here, confocal, to identify which ones were the dark cells, the red ones were the dark ones, and which one were the light cells, the purple ones. And once we did the overlay here, we identified and said, okay, let us now analyze these cells and look at the elemental con um, components. And it was clear that the 
um, the black spots, in other words, the ones that turned out red in autofluorescence, have much higher potassium, calcium, and sodium than the ones that weren't full in color. What this means is now the researchers further, they can go and, and research it further. My, my background is not plant or um, especially uh, nutrients cons cons constitutes, but this gives them the, the, the means to study further what is going on in these black spots. Right, that is the examples I wanted to go through and I will join um, Jürgen at the end to answer some questions. So this is now back to Jürgen. Thank you, Jürgen. Yeah. Great, thanks Lisa. Uh, I've also had to start learning or start to learn plot biology again with <laughs> with the samples we're getting in and it's um, always quite interesting to, to see how they are um, using the same technologies we are in more of the cell biology field. All right, so um, these are just to make sure is my uh, screen shared on that side. Yes, I can see it. Thanks. Great. Okay, right. So we discussed this arm now with the shuttle and find approach. Now I'm going to give more detail on the resin embedding uh, protocol. So when you start this, the protocol we most likely follow, or we on, on a standard basis follow, is this Edison Mega Metal Protocol. And it works best for um, more detailed biological samples. My background is more cellular biology, so I've worked with the cells uh, that are grown on the specialized uh, grid dishes. And these grids help us to identify our regions of interest on the fluorescence microscope. This is also possible um, not just for cells, but for certain tissue types where you can uh, label or where you have transgenic animals and um, they have inherent fluorescence and this is sectioned beforehand. But in terms of what you stain your uh, tissue with, you are limited to genetic um, modification uh, because um, antibody staining does give some, uh, does have some drawbacks because you're already permeabilizing uh, your tissues beforehand and that's something that can cause issues downstream. So in this case, uh, cells were uh, transfected uh, with GFP plasma and they were stained with a, a stain that can be retained after fixation. So uh, after whatever treatment protocol was followed, if you're assessing the effects of different drugs on cells, uh, then you would follow this and fix them before taking them to the fluorescence microscope. So here, like Lisa mentioned with uh, other samples previously, we take a wide um, field image or just this is still, this is on confocal, but just 10 times magnification. And I picked a bunch of different cells that I, uh, thought were, uh, would be of interest, and I labeled each one with a specific uh, number and letter. And I also found in which grid this was. Then this is a 60 times magnification of one of these regions, and uh, z stacks were acquired as well. So after your fluorescence image is acquired, this would be fixed again in the same cover slip or cover slip dish with glutaraldehyde and uh, paraformaldehyde. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on the specific time it takes for each incubation. Uh, the detailed protocol can be shared with you uh, when you um, are going to conduct this. After this, the really fun part starts when you work with everything that can kill you. <laughs> so uh, this heavy metal staining happens in a well-controlled humid um, with proper protective equipment and so forth. But uh, you're staining the, the uh, sample with osmium, potassium ferrocyanide, urinal acetate, and lead aspartate. This is all for contrast on the EM. And um, this has to be prepared in certain ways and certain buffers. But if this is not followed correctly, then your electron microscopy component is going to uh, 
suffer quite heavily. And this also sometimes has to be optimized between different samples. So we, we know what works for, for cells very well, but um, there are modified protocols online that have uh, different uh, concentrations. Then lastly, like uh, some of you who have done histology and so forth will uh, recognize this with the increasing concentrations of the um, ethanol, where you then further dehydrate the sample so that we get um, as much moisture out of it as, as possible. Right, then the seventh step would be the resin embedding. For resin, we use uh, Epon or uh, Dirkopan resins, the very sticky, viscous uh, liquid that is an absolute headache to, <laughs> to mix and work with. But uh, we need to um, embed this uh, sample of choice into a material that can be sectioned later onwards. So up until this point, and why I mentioned it's tedious, it would take about two days. Um, the uh, sample has to be put in a baking oven at 60 degrees for 48 hours. The resin is first poured into a capsule like this, and uh, the cover slip is placed um, on top of it, or you place the capsule on top of the cover slip. After it's uh, baked overnight, you detach the capsule from the cover slip, and what happens here is the cells have now, in the, or in this case cells, have been transferred and taken up by the resin and detached from the cover slip. So now you have this entire block that is containing uh, your, uh, all of your cells with the grid pattern embedded as well. Now, the second important step here is because we are working with a grid pattern, we can view this under a stereo microscope and find the specific grid of choice and trim this out. Now, in some um, papers, this would be just a nice uh, animation like this where, okay, you trim it out and there you go. But because this is quite a robust material, we physically have to clamp this down and start sawing around it just to, to trim this uh, to a smaller size. And then afterwards, for the for the second step, uh, we place this into an ultra microtome, and um, we trim this further down to a very very small area, which is pretty much equivalent to the size of the initial grid. Ultra microtomy, ultra microtomy, or ultra microtome sectioning, is quite uh, intensive protocol on its own. Uh, Lisa is pretty much the expert there and I'm trying to catch up with her. But what would happen here is what is also referred to as tomography, where this sample is sectioned usually with a diamond knife. Uh, this is aligned and um, we make sure that the sectioning happens in a, a cohesive fa uh, fashion. And because we're working with very thin slices. This can go down to about 70 nanometers in um, slice, slice width. The sections are caught onto uh, this water reservoir and it's scooped up. In this case, this is a 10 grid, but um, we also use silicon nano wafers to catch this onto a um, material that can be placed into a sample holder on the additional microscope. So it's quite intensive up until here. And uh, if something goes wrong with your sectioning, then your samples are pretty much done for. So we do section them in, or we cut out the block in a trapezoid shape just to help with the orientation. But that is where you would uh, process the samples for uh, electron microscopy. Then finding, especially when you're working with cells that don't have fiducial markers. So with the Shetland Fry protocol, it is much more straightforward than uh, this scenario. So in this case, I at least knew uh, what cells I were looking for and the block was cut out that I could more or less recognize other cells on the EM. Usually you are able to find the corresponding images. So in this case, these are my um, a section within the cells that I uh, found. 
And here I further uh, went into detail on this cell. And in terms of orientation, we see that this is completely more, or is pretty much flipped around from the orientation here. So uh, here you see these dendrites um, growing outward, and here you see uh, that in pretty much a mirror image, so to say. So that's why when we do the overlay, there is um, lots of attention given to uh, signal transformation um, or image processing to then convert this to the same orientation and overlay this. And then I deconvolutated the signal and uh, we, yeah, so then you manage to see what kind of proteins are associated with these vacuoles. Uh, in this case, we were doing an autophagy study, so we labeled the um, plasmid with uh, LC3 GFP and we stained site, um, acidic vacuoles with uh, this lysotracker, tracker, so we knew that these vacuoles were indeed acidic and um, they're overlaid with the GFP that also gives an indication that these these were a certain type of, of vacuole. This image processing alone can also take uh, quite a long time. So knowing which cells you are interested in is, is extremely important. This was an example of one protocol, which uh, is referred to as pre-embedding claim. This is what we have optimized and what we are most comfortable with. There are other protocols to follow. In some papers, you would um, read about uh, cryo-sectioning, and others you would read about in resin CLEM, which is something I'm trying to optimize as well, where you would uh, embed the sample in resin and uh, stain them for fluorescence afterwards. This is uh, possible for certain kinds of samples, but uh, the pre-embedding protocol is quite versatile for a bunch of different uh, biological use cases. So uh, if you do read up on um, claim protocols and you realize one of the other ones are more in line with what you would need, we can uh, optimize this with you, but just bear in mind it's going to then take a chunk out of your uh, own study in terms of uh, time management. Now for, for some um, examples and also referring to image protocols, Processing, there are a few key things to, to bear in mind. The first is that you are interested in transforming your fluorescence image to the parameters and resolution of an electron microscope image and not the other way around. So your EM image will dictate how much your fluorescence image has to be transformed. For um, samples that don't contain uh, some kind of fiducial marker. So in this case, I wasn't working with any fiducial markers at all. Uh, I would require something along the lines of uh, light image or a TPMT channel that I can see the actual more or less cellular morpho morphology. So this is this light, lighter channel that isn't fluorescing in the sample. Because your Z stacks or your step width on the fluorescence microscope is much different than what you're actually sectioning. Taking a, a hefty stack of at least 30 or 40 slices on the fluorescence image, uh, fluorescence microscope, uh, help, would help a lot with identifying your core structures of interest and also with alignment. Uh, this is a nice example that I conducted on um, glioma cells or um, brain cancer cells where you can see here this um, nucleus in the middle looks like uh, almost like a Pac-Man uh, shape or uh, this cutout. And on the TPMT channel here, I, you can uh, more or less modify it, but it's flipped the other way around. So after I process this in um, my favorite software to use for uh, channel alignment and processing is called IC. IC Bioimage Analysis Software, which has a plugin called ECClaim. And then I uh, designate a bunch of different points to, re, uh, trans to transform the orientation. And here I could see, okay, this nuclear envelope is lining up more, much better with my electron image. Then we went much further in depth here to associate um, 
certain uh, proteins and um, elements or um, stains with uh, these vacuoles, and then we eventually could subdivide these vacuoles into different, uh, in, according to their characteristics. Uh, this software, I will upload a video on separately just how to go about um, doing this on your own. Uh, there's also um, our most widely used uh, image processing tool is um, for everything else I use ImageJ or Fiji. They do have a big warp plugin, which does more or less the same thing, but I found EasyClaim to be a bit more user-friendly uh, for someone who isn't uh, that familiar um, or starting with it, but it, it does get quite technical further. So it's, it's quite uh, user-friendly uh, to me to use. So examples of this, I've now spoken about these um, data from, from my studies. So uh, claim on uh, normal cells is what we would, would usually do. And uh, transformation of this image to a line here. Uh, it can be quite tricky to get the right cell, but eventually on the uh, electron microscope, we could identify uh, double membrane vacuoles and the forming FAGA4 over there which correlated to GFP signal. So this was actually quite uh, quite an exci exciting finding uh, for us. However, uh, one thing that I'm most excited about what we will be able to offer in the future is this uh, 3D claim component. So this is an example of um, a super resolution uh, image that was conducted by uh, Dimitri de Dimquana during her PhD. And this is a good example of how well we are integrated in the international network. Uh, we didn't have a uh, block face or a FIB sim um, or a three dimensional e or an electron microscope that can do 3D acquisition yet at this time. But we were able to uh, prep the samples to the quality that uh, was sufficient to our our collaborators overseas at the Crick Institute in London to conduct a uh, FIBSIM on um, or you know, the 3D EM on these samples. So here, uh, this is what I was referring to with the, the you, why, you would, you, why you would use them, and um, this is where the segmentation comes in. So we use the fluorescence channel to identify the structure of interest and locate it uh, on the EM. Then, because this electron microscopy stack is actually now also um, in Z. We could follow and track this along and render the um, structure of choice out as it goes through the stack. And here is the render of the super resolution image. And after um, the process alignment, you can see that this elongated structure is more or less what, what I managed to render out here or segment out. So this is pretty much Perhaps the most powerful component of CLEM is how far it can go in terms of um, three-dimensional alignment. Also at the CRIC uh, is a, uh, the study that they did on um, toxoplas toxoplasma gondii infection. And um, they were interested in how the actin cytoskeleton is transformed during infection. So here in this uh, fluorescence image, you can see the, the actin network throughout this bundle of cells, and they could identify uh, the same bundle of cells on, on the EM, and hopefully this video plays, yeah. So what we will be able to do as well in the future is go through a whole stack of, of these cells and re uh, segment out the same structures that were visible on the fluorescent microscope. The video is just going to, yeah. So here you can then see where the actin structures were mapped out and that they were associated with, with each cell. And because you have the fluorescent channel that gives you the outline of uh, where these interactions happen, you can pretty much go crazy. <laughs> so uh, this is one of the most exciting elements. Just a uh, dis disclaimer, this was conducted on a FIBSIM, so it's not the same one that we have here, 
But I think this is a very good example of how uh, far the field has come with starting from a fluorescence image, taking it all the way into um, functional parameters and uh, rendering out uh, these important uh, structures of interest. So in this case, they could see how the actin network was changed during um, parasitic infection. Now challenges. So with every protocol, there's obviously some drawbacks and some and issues to overcome. When working with uh, cell monolayer specifically, you need, you need to bear, bear in mind that these cells are only fixed into the first few microns of the resin, so 10 to 15 um, micrometer in depth of the resin. But the cytoplasm of your cell is probably only in the first one to two microns. So this is why we section in uh, nanometer width. So uh, sectioning is, is one of the most crucial steps here. And if you're uh, doing it on um, single slices, then some data might be lost along the way, and it does uh, complicate the procedure to find the correct cell afterwards. Uh, finding the correct cell then, uh, bearing in mind that each uh, slice in the fluorescent stack is uh, representing 800 to 1,000 or 0 0.8 to 1 micron per slice, and the resin section only has, uh, yeah, would be 7 nanometers in width. So correlating these um, is does present a, a big challenge. And um, one thing that uh, I've now started to suggest is that as the sectioning occurs, you uh, collect the wafers and label them in a way that they were acquired during sectioning, so that as we image it on the EM, we kind of can create our own little uh, three-dimensional stack of this um, sectioning. The accuracy of the overlay you eventually do is to a certain extent software and user dependent. Sometimes you don't need such an accurate overlay. If you need a certain indication of where things are localized, then uh, the process is much quicker. If it needs to be more detailed, especially with super resolution data, uh, it it does become it can become a computational bottleneck sometimes, but uh, it's not that um, it's not impossible to overcome, but it's something to, to definitely bear in mind. Now, in terms of logistics, so if you are interested in conducting claim, uh, the most important part would be to start uh, cons uh, arrange a consultation with me and uh, Lisa so we can determine uh, the correct protocol for you. Uh, in the past, there's been um, some confusion as to how long this will take. Uh, sometimes, or one time someone pitched up and said they have an EM booking the same day after the fluorescence booking, and this was just definitely not possible. So this entire process can take one to two weeks, uh, depending on the amount of samples and uh, the kind of sample. But if you are trying to conduct this, you need to dedicate some time solely to pr this process. The fluorescence, uh, Samples or the fluorescent samples are more likely going to be prepped at um, the Stellenbosch fluorescence microscopy unit. And uh, afterwards, you can bring the fixed sample to the EM unit. Uh, and we have the re all the required reagents to prep this further. Some labs do have their own reagents that they use uh, if the students are uh, trained to conduct the processing. And then th the kind of processing required would depend on whether we conduct the imaging at uh, Stellenbosch, which would be the Zeiss um, instrument with the shuttle and find, or um, now at Tigerberg, where I am, uh, with the uh, ultramicrotome and then imaging the resin sections on our uh, Thermo Fisher instrument uh, here. Then the last step would be with the image processing. This is dependent on the amount of data, and uh, I can perform this for you if I know uh, the correct uh, parameters of your samples. Uh, for more intensive workloads, uh, there is a very good workstation PC at the fluorescent um, microscope unit. We can have you log in remotely as well, 
um, to conduct this if your current computer, uh, PC or laptop uh, is just not going to make it and you see you need some more computational power, we can help you with that. And um, I will provide some training material that if it's uh, easy overlay to do, uh, you can you will be more than able to conduct this uh, yourself. Right, so for inquiries, uh, you can um, contact me or, or the EM um, unit managers, Madeleine Freisenberg. Uh, Madeleine is more experienced with plant material than I am. I'm more of the biology guy in the EM unit now. And um, these uh, will be able to assist with any issues regarding fluorescence microscopy. And with that, I leave you with the smiling red blood cell. Uh, this, this is what happens when you image too many samples um, for too long and you start seeing things. And this, uh, this fold started looking like a smiley face. And then I just drew these eyes on it. And yeah, so thank you for this, uh, for attending. I hope that we will see some of you um, or be able to help some of you with your projects. And good luck with, with all of your uh, studies in, in the future. All right, thank you, Jürgen. I didn't see any questions in the meeting chat, so I don't know if there's any um, of the participants who would like to unmute yourself and ask a question. You can also put your hand up, um, but this is the time to ask. And um, I'd like to ask uh, using resin uh, to do the TEM way that we just spoke about that Jürgen presented. Um, it, it looks like mostly it starts with normal histology doing sex and then getting the fluorescence and then doing the overlay. So I'm very worried about the huge gap that he actually pointed out in his uh, second last slide uh, between the normal histology into detailed structures in, in the cell. And then he presented the slide showing that there's a possibility that one can actually uh, embed your sample initially for light microscopy uh, with a, a resin-based uh, embedding medium. And I just wanted to know, I'm busy looking into that, um, and I wanted to know whether you've done something like that. Because they can make a one micron section and then the gap is much smaller. Um, yes, we've um, last year there was a student who um, came with samples of I think it was hair that they've optimized. Um, it was from UCT, so she already had the samples embedded in resin, and she managed to do her own sectioning on an ultra microtome there. But then they they were able then to to stain the samples on. We we sectioned it onto uh, the cover slip, the 20, the 22 millimeter by 22 millimeter cover slip. Put the resin sections on there and then we image as she stained them and then we managed to, to image it was a two or three color dye or two or three color experiment and we actually managed to image it on the confocal and then immediately take it over with, to the Merlin here because it could be used with shuttle and fine due to the fact that we could put it on the cover slip. The problem with fluorescent staining and why we say it needs optimization is as soon as you put the sample in resin you might be blocking the the um, epitopes where the fluorescent dyes might have to bind. Um, that some dyes don't want to work, don't work. Others do work, and there are protocols out there, and there, it's been done um, in labs overseas. So yes, it's definitely an, a possibility. Um, but for each and every fluorophore, you need to test it. There might be optimization required for a very specific experiment every time. It's not something we can guarantee every time and say, okay, we, we can do this, everyone come with your samples. Every every type of fluorophore needs to be optimized to see what resin embedding would still allow the fluorescent staining to um, be visible on the confocal. Does that answer your question? Hello, Hannes? Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, I think it answers my question. Um, see, I, the resin embedding that I use, I use a normal microtome to do sections of one micron. Okay. So I don't have to go to the trouble of going through an ultra micron because there's only a few, uh, the population of people that can use an ultra microtome is very small So uh, in the world. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's, it's much easier for me <laughs> to use a normal microtome. <laughs> Which resin are you using, or are, are, in which um, substance do you embed the sample? 
I, I I think I'm the only one in South Africa that uses it, but I use a techno bit resin. Uh, it's a, I think it's an acrylic resin that I import from Germany. And I've been using it for years, um, okay. getting very good uh, section for histology, but never tried the um, immunostaining, for instance, on it. And I, they've just recently developed a kit that you can do immunostaining, which I'm still trying. So, you yeah. know. If you can do immunostaining, if you can do immunostaining with it, even if it's with nano gold or something, the the possibility is also in there that you would be able to stain it with fluorescence um, tagged uh, antibodies, as long as the antibody can bind to the epitope, that that would be um, then perfect for for fluorescence as well. I don't know the reason myself, as you say, you might be the only one. Um, but we've been advised that alor white um, is not as um, the the construct of alor white resin is not as um, uh, it doesn't block the the epitopes as much as the uh, it's a softer resin than Durkipan. Durkipan I don't think will it work easily. It's a very viscous resin, um, and the other one that we know of is oh epon um, might also work. But yeah, it's something that you have to test and see. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we need to find out how can we get rid of, how can we then open up the epitopes for binding? Yeah, the um, the issue there would also be if this is only prepping for normal histology, imaging, then uh, the pre-processing would be different because this will then have to be imaged under an electron microscope eventually as well. So sometimes with, or in general, when you're permeabilizing a sample to be able to uh, have antibodies bind or, or so forth, then it would interfere or compromise the sample when you're, when you're adding other kinds of heavy metals into, in, into it. So uh, the basics of a histology prep and um, in resin claim, um, as you're suggesting, would, uh, would differ along the lines of processing the sample for uh, in resin to them. I have to say I would be very interested to, to at least um, see what we can do. So you're more than welcome yeah. to email us and we can maybe do a, a proper discussion, um, have a meeting and, and properly discuss what you want to do. And like like uh, Jurgen suggested, we, we talk about it first and we determine what would be the best way forward. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Do you have another question or, or are there any other people? I don't want to stop you. You can, you're more than welcome to ask more questions. But um, if, if there is anyone I, else. I, I, yes. wanted, I wanted to know about cell size. I mean, in, in this uh, correlated stone, it, it seems to me that we're working with quite large cells. Or is that just the examples that you use? Yeah, those were, those were only examples to uh, show uh, you know how you find the same same sample, and uh, if you if you view the entire cell, then it it makes the uh, presentation more or seeing how different orientations are just uh, more visible. But uh, you can, I mean, do a TEM claim where you go down to you know nanometer uh, resolution. Um, if if you combine that with the correct fluorescent modality, then you can go down to quite a small uh, resolution on the EM. These were just example images um, that I've had. Yeah. Any other questions? You're more than welcome to ask else. Um, yeah, Jurgen, you have some final comments? <laughs> uh, no, so um, one good uh, element now is we have uh, two electron microscopes that are running at both campuses. Uh, the Zeiss Merlin is at Stellenbosch um, where you know it's um, quick to do the shuttle and find for you. Um, but uh, important thing is we can get the same um, image quality on both for conventional SEM and uh, STEM. So sometimes if that system is booked out and you have a claim sample that isn't shuttle and find based then uh, we can image it here at Tigerberg. Uh, if you are, are actually in Tigerberg itself, uh, then we do everything here. 
Uh, so the logistics of um, be going between the campuses for EM is uh, mitigated now. Um, and we're also closer to, uh, you know, all the Cape Town areas and airports and, and so forth. So that's just uh, something that you can also uh, take into account when you're trying to figure out where to do your sample prep and so forth. Uh, we're located on both campuses now for EM. And uh, these, are, I think, with the fluorescence uh, section, the only super resolution we would have is at the Stellenbosch unit, but there, the basic conf there is a fluorescence microscope here for normal confocal use at Tigerberg as well, right? Uh, it's not a confocal microscope, it's a normal wide field, uh, but the wide field, yeah. fairly good quality images. I would um, still recommend coming to Stellenbosch. The, the problem in terms of two campuses isn't really that much because we do have that time. They, they needs to be processing in between and we can easily yeah. um, deal with that. It's not yeah. problematic. Yeah. Okay. okay.